Akira for the Famicom by Taito, released Christmas Eve 1988 in Japan only, based on Katsuhiro Otomo's series of graphic novels turned worldwide phenomenon of an anime feature film. Now, prior to starting the review, take note that since the entire game's in Japanese, I'll be outlining most of the in-game text elements thanks to my all-new T3 initiative, or my trusty translation techniques. And for those wondering, yes, I even have a walkthrough of the entire game using my own translations alone, released prior to, if not long after, the fan-translated patch by Pennywise, Niahak, and Dank, the penultimate of whose name includes a 1 in place of an I. And if they're watching this, I'd like to take this opportunity and pass along my honorable regards and kudos. That's one promising title sequence if I ever saw one. Seriously? A typo on committee? There's two C's, not one! Reaction aside, onto the plotline. If you've read the graphic novels or seen the film, which I have countless times, regardless of which version suits me best, you should already be damn familiar with the overall storyline. God help me if I meet anyone who isn't. And once again, in this game's case, it's based on the latter. It's set in 2019, 31 years after an unexpected blast by an unknown force causing the eradication of Tokyo. In an eventual World War III, the newly structured dystopian metropolis of Neo-Tokyo is inhabited by not only the government, but also corrupt politicians and even Bosozoku bike gangs, most notably the Capsules and the Clowns. Perspective-wise, the game is focused on the former mentioned gang's leader, Shotaro Kaneda, or Kaneda if you prefer, as he attempts to unravel the mystery behind said unknown force and even find out what the hell's eating away at his childhood right-hand associate Tetsuo Oshima. As for the two main characters, Shotaro Kaneda and Tetsuo Oshima are voiced in Japanese by Mitsuo Iwata and Ozomu Sasaki, respectively. In the 89 Streamline dub, Cam Clark, aka Jimmy Flinders, of the late 80s Ninja Turtles animated series fame, and Jan Rapson, aka Stanley Gert Jr., of various Disney and Universal films, Hu Dao on G-Force, and even various villains on James Bond Jr., voiced the two respectively. And finally, in the Jinyan Universal Animes dub from 2001, John Young Bosch of Power Rangers, Trigun, and Bleach fame, and Joshua Seth of Digimon and Cyborg 009 fame voiced the two respectively. Info and intel aside, under the rudimentary gameplay aspect, basically, it plays itself out in visual novel form as depicted in the anime flick, starting with Tetsuo's iconic highway accident during an epic scuffle with the clowns in terms of his bike being crashed into one of the test subjects. Upon Kaneda's arrival to the system, within minutes, the Capsule Gang, not just Kaneda and Tetsuo themselves, but also Kai, Yamagata, Kuwata, Takeyama, and Watanabe, who we'll see later, gets detained by the Army, namely the Japan Self-Defense Forces, and taken in for questioning, except for the brutally wounded Tetsuo, who gets taken in for experimentation. And at that very point, when the capsules are questioned by the army officers, this is where the meat of the gameplay takes place. You're given a plethora of possible choices to pick out in order to branch out the story further. In other cases, you can even point and click on certain subjects, in terms of supporting characters, background elements, and the like. These choices can either result in further plot development and or alteration, or halting it altogether. Should the latter occur, mostly in terms of picking the wrong fucking choice, one of two possible Game Over-themed cutscenes are displayed depending on the severity of your most regretful decision, either Kaneda having his ass thrown in the old Who's Gal, or wasted, in other words, dead, nailed, you get the drift, and definitely not the drunk or stone kind, oh shit no, at which point you can continue with the plot, or end it altogether complete with a password via the A or B button singularly. For the sake of deliberately hindering myself from spoiling any additional plot points or elements, the itinerary of this particular adaptation, besides the earlier recounted highway accident and army arrest, not to mention interrogation scenes, centers around more familiar ones, including the waiting area where the Freedom Revolution rioting maniac starts all kinds of shit with his grenade, a half-assed one at that, no less. Later getting a serious case of the red ass by the army officers. Followed by Kaneda and Kay's post-interrogation get-together, complete with the iconic explosion set off from that very same grenade. 
The Capsules High School hangouts with their groupies, if in this game's case just one of them, after receiving the ultimate discipline punishment by their phys ed teacher, Mr. Takaba, aka Jaws. Okay, we are so not going there. Followed by Tetsuo and his better half, Kaori, taking off on Kaneda's bike. The Harukiya bartender, who randomly, and I do mean randomly, calls out whichever ward of Neo Tokyo the two are hiding out in. So if I were you, I'd pay attention at all costs to that randomly displayed number. Yet another street scuffle with the clowns. Tetsuo's power taking hold while Kaneda and Kai express their concern for him, leading up to his recapture by the Army Science Department. The Rooftop Garden's promenade checkpoint hangouts, in which the usual terror shootout ensues, followed by a sewer clash, both of which involve the aforementioned Kai. Her reunion with the Resistance Group and their detainment of Kaneda, and later their decision to enlist them in their attempt to stop Tetsuo's bullshit, to name several. Oh, and by the way, following said plot point, this is where the gameplay shift is set in motion. Breaking away from the typical plot branching decisions, an FPS mode takes place in the wiring shaft sewers, where Kaneda needs to eradicate seven FPH cruisers. In terms of controls for this part, A and B are used to fire Kaneda's gun and make them take cover respectively, where Select makes them swap sides whenever applicable. If you make Kaneda wait around on one side too long, or expose him to any gunfire, it's an instant game over. Should she happen to survive this part, however, a rail shooter then takes place where both Kaneda and Kate haul ass for the baby room, while eradicating and or avoiding each and every dickwad guard in the path without letting one of them stop you dead center. Following yet another plot string or two, the iconic Rubble Heap confrontation with Tetsuo ensues, where you're guiding the aiming trajectory of Kaneda's new experimental laser beam, and firing it randomly until the battery runs out, as long as you don't accidentally zap his ass. And the same applies during the famous Olympic Stadium scene near the end, right before his horrific as fuck mutation, we have to place Kay's mirror on the left side, and fire at that exact position. Now, as I pointed out earlier, since the entire game's in Japanese, assuming you're not experimenting with the fan-translated patches, or if you've never seen the flick, you'll have a tough-ass time comprehending each plot element, let alone each corresponding menu, which is why, yet again, I've taken the liberty of providing my own translations as displayed everywhere throughout. The controls, to say the absolute least, are mixed bag. Not that they're derelict and out of whack in any form, specifically in terms of the menu command choices. The FPS aiming portions, however, leave God knows how much to be desired, and as dull as the gameplay procedure can become, it's actually not that much of a drag whatsoever. Concerning Akira's challenge, even if, take note, this is my last reiteration ever, you've never seen the film, lots of trial and error is a huge must if you're willing to make the plot thicken any broader. Therefore, I suggest referring back to the gameplay elements I've touched upon so far. Should you decide to continue following a game over, you have to start back from the beginning of a previous chapter in order to make the entire story play itself the fuck out, and that can be incredibly humdrum beyond words, thus quoting Kotaku, losing almost everything that made the film appealing to fans. Also, getting back to the FPS aiming portions, their premise and aesthetics are pretty much the same deal as in Kemko and Infogram's Rescue, Vitsukai's Gogol 13 games, and even <clears throat> another title classic, both Operation Wolf and its follow-up Operation Thunderbolt, though there's barely any intensity here at all. Not only do you have to lay a shot on the FPH craft precisely upon its appearance, taking cover well in advance whenever their gunfire projectiles appear is also a huge must, not to mention swapping sites to maintain said intensity, because you'll never know when an enemy FPH cruiser will swoop in and have the upper hand on your ass. Anyways, apart from everything else, if the plot so happens to become commonplace to you, the entire game should be completed in at least an hour, including the aforementioned FPS gameplay feature deviations. And bear in mind the password continuation hint I examined earlier, which I strongly recommend jotting down, very legibly I should add, or looking up online for future reference. Visually, for yet another Famicom game, hell, a worthy anime film to game adaptation released months following its rightful source material's theatrical debut, nonetheless. Taito and Tose, its right-hand developer, whose resume includes these titles listed here, have truly done it the most deserved justice imaginable. Each and every corresponding visual definitely represents the anime film to a T from start to finish, including its iconic poster design, you know, Kaneda walking to his bike, seen at the beginning with one of two English typos, not to mention all the key scenes, where they're lacking or possessing any animation or additional backgrounds whatsoever. And the character likenesses, not just Kaneda and Tetsuo, but also the Capsules, the Colonel, the Espers, Kyoko, Takashi, and Masaru. Need I go any further? They definitely match their source material counterparts. As far as text, refer back to what I've discussed about my translations, though in my case, nothing personal, but I had to make them as original and appropriate to the film's dialogue as possible, while not paraphrasing way too much. All in all, notwithstanding any lacking elements, or how dreadfully the presentation's aged, it's still eye-pleasing and tolerable, in a matter of throwing out the long and short, of course.
Music and sound wise, supervised and orchestrated by Toshiko Kawanishi. While none of the original tracks are identical to those in the film composed by Tsutomu Ohashi, alias Shoji Yamashiro, alongside his collective Geno Yamashiro Gumi, as much as I rightfully abhor harping on them, they pretty much run the gamut from somewhat sustainable to beyond generic and plotting, with a side order of eerie be shrillness, with the exception of that bitch and intro theme. And to paraphrase some call me Johnny, fuck, there's barely any soundtrack at all! There's gonna be god knows how many times, where aside from hearing the cutscene's corresponding sound effects and or scores, you'll end up getting shit all but text scrolling beeps, and they just never end. Christ getting teabagged and deep throated by Psycho from Earthworm Jim and Warhead from Vector Man while shoving a giant spiked cucumber up his ass. They never fucking end! Ah, but what the hell, it's something I can get used to any day. Why even continue bitching? Replayability-wise, due in part to the multiple plot occurrences that take place in Move Your Decisions, even if you're not familiar with it, and pretty much everything I've outlined thus far, in terms of gameplay and the like. To which, for the last time, I cannot stress enough in warning everyone to refer the hell back. You'll be casually diving back into the visual novel of Akira, in more ways than one, if to an unlikely degree. Therefore, what's my final verdict here? Compared to every other adaptation that followed this one, some of which failed very miserably, I'm looking at you, Akira, for the Amiga CD32 by ICE, or International Computer Entertainment, in full, released only in Europe in 94, no less. And don't even get me started on the failed multi-console adaptations by THQ from the 90s, which for some reason got cancelled despite being slated for release. This particular Famicom adaptation pretty much trumps the shit out of them, despite the unfavorable reception and reviews it exposed itself to at the time. Also, in spite of all the stumbling blocks I've laid down throughout, not only is it easy to see why this game never saw the light of day globally, unlike its source material, it's still a tolerable and genuine title, which takes serious dedication, trial and error, plot element recollection, and a whole lot more. If you've relished, adored, and cherished the film and or the graphic novels to no foreseeable end for a long-ass time, I fully advise tracking this down like that weak-ass resistance agent with whom number 26, Takashi, was briefly tagging along before his ass got gunned down. But also take note, as it holds true with the other import games I've covered in the past, a direct Famicom to NES converter is a huge, huge prerequisite. Or if you've got the means to play the fan-translated patch by Pennywise & Associates, hey, go nuts! And until then, folks, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off. <laughs>